today on Point of the Spear. By the end of the war, because of this elaborate and really pretty amazing intelligence program, they said Eisenhower probably knew more about the German military operations than Hitler did. Author Robert Sutton is here to talk about a secret Nazi interrogation unit during World War II that helped win the war. And we'll hear from him right after this break. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. Welcome back. Today's guest spent 33 years with the National Park Service and retired recently as their chief historian. His book is called Nazis on the Potomac, the top secret intelligence operation that helped win World War II. And author Robert Sutton joins us now. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you. I love the title of your book. It, it sounds like a major motion picture. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, I'm lousy at picking titles. So my son and my wife picked it for me. <laughs> well, <clears throat> well done. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I, will pa- I will pass that along. <laughs> Good. Yeah, no, well done. How did you learn about this story? It had been classified for so long. Well, I learned about it. Um, I was I worked for the National Park Service. And um, I was appointed as the chief historian of the National Park Service in 2007. And the first day or the weekend before my first day in that office, uh, so it would have been like the end of September um, of 2007, there was an article in the Washington Post about uh, a reunion that had taken place at Fort Hunt of soldiers who were stationed there during World War II and it talked about you know the, the different programs that were at Fort, Fort Hunt. Uh, it, meant, it said that most of the men who were there were Jewish, and it also said that the park was engaged in oral history interviews. Now, I had been in the region um, the, of the Park Service where, where this park is located. I know the superintendent knew, knew and know him quite well. So one of the, the first thing I did um, as chief historian was to call the superintendent my friend, Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I'd really like to meet with you and with the folks who are doing this project, because I think we can maybe have some mutual benefits here. So that week, so it'd be the first week of October 2007, I went over to George Washington Memorial Parkway, in which uh, Fort Hunt is located, met with the folks who were doing this project. And we had a, we had a, a chat and they said, you know, they'd completed about 20 or so, 20, 30 interviews, and they were they were going to do a few more, but they had sort of run out of money, and they were going to just take what they had and, and run with it. I said, as chief historian, I think I can find some money. What you need to do is you need to interview absolutely everybody who's still alive, and I will help pay for it, mm-hmm. which I did. <laughs> and uh, they had to travel to California and different places. Um, and I was able to scrounge up some money. It was actually one of the few times I had some money. And um, so that was my involvement early on. And I was fascinated with this story from, from that point on. Um, I retired from the Park Service early 2016. And this project just kind of hung with me. And it had been, they had the oral history interviews. Had, they had done about 65 of them. Um, wow. By the time they finished, uh, the story was just an amazing, wonderful story that I thought needed to be told. And so that's how I got involved with uh, doing this project and doing this book. Are any of those interviews on video or is it all audio? They all are. Oh, they all are. All the interviews are posted. Um, it's if you go to, I, it's, well, if you go to Fort Hunt, Fort Hunt Oral History. I think if you Google Fort Hunt Oral History Project, it goes to the website and there's there's a button you can push. I think it explains the project. And there's a button that you can push for interviews. And most, not all, but most of the interviews have been transcribed. And people can either read the transcription, that's what I did, or you can uh, look at the video of the actual interview. Let's or see. listen listen to audio or video of the interview. It's it's really they really did a I would say a magnificent job with this with this project. It, it sounds a little like the Veterans History Project. It really is very similar. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a great resource that I've used. Now, the interrogators, the American servicemen working in this program, a lot of them were Jewish. Was there a reason for that beyond the obvious reason? Many of them were Jewish. Um, and almost all of the Jews who were involved in this program um, were either German or Austrian refugees who had fled, mostly when they were children, actually, had fled uh, Nazi Germany and Austria and other countries in Europe um, in, the, in the 1930s. Now, the reason that we included most of the people who were included here were, were really on the younger end of the people who were stationed at Fort Hunt because uh, by the time we started the oral history project, most of them were, were well into their 80s yeah. and a lot of them were gone. So we tried to catch as many as we could. Uh, and most of them were, a lot of them actually were, were at Fort Hunt toward the end of the program. So uh, that was, uh, yeah, it was fine, it was great. But the reason that they were, that they were selected, there, there, were, there were, I think, uh, I would say three reasons. First of all, um, they were German or Austrian. Um, they knew the language. They spoke the language like a native. In fact, one of the one of the veterans, uh, not at Fort Hunt, but a veteran, a, a Jewish veteran from World War II, um, was very upset because he was uh, put into a into this interrogation program when what he really wanted to do was go shoot Nazis. I mean, that's that's what he wanted to do in the army. Yeah. He said that the. Um, he, on, on reflection, he said, you know, you can teach somebody to fire a gun or throw a hand grenade in six weeks or six months, but in six years or six lifetimes, you really cannot teach somebody to talk, to speak German as a native. And he saw the, the real benefit of what he was doing. So that was one reason that they spoke the language, they understood the language, they understood a lot of the nuances of the language, but they also understood culture. So um, one of the veterans, um, he was not at Fort Hunt, but I actually got in touch with him. He, um, by the name of um, Guy Stern, who is either at or close to 100 years old now. Wow. Um, he knew a lot of the men at Fort Hunt. He said that one of the things that was a benefit for him interrogating prisoners, he interrogated prisoners in, in, in Europe, was that he uh, had played soccer, knew soccer quite well, and so he had he had something that he could converse with German soldiers about. So that was just one example. They had they could just talk about German food. They could I mean they could they actually could converse, you know, one person to another, uh, yeah. and that was a benefit. I think the the other thing that was really um, I think quite important here is all of all of these guys were really smart they were really really smart and they didn't require a lot of they didn't it didn't require a lot of supervision or they had to be trained but it didn't require a lot of supervision in fact um one of the men who was stationed in a program and i've been in touch with him he is still still quite quite active i think he's 97 98 years old his name is paul fairbrook mm -hmm. he was in the program called the uh, um MIRS, which is Military Intelligence um, wait a minute, M -I -R, uh, Research Service Center. Um, I'm probably getting that wrong. MIRS, Military Intelligence Research Section. Section, there we go. Section. Anyway, he um, he said, and this was a program that, that uh, translated, captured, German documents and then put them into, you know, wrote, wrote reports uh, and were very detailed. He said that they, there were about 20 in this program. They were supervised by a man who was German, but he had been, he was not a native German. I mean, he was a native German, but he'd been, he was not really good with language. But both the supervisor and the men that were there said they did not need any supervision. They didn't. I mean, once they, they knew what they were doing, they were very good at it, and uh, they were so motivated that super. It, they if they left them alone, they could do their job. So that so they were intelligent, they were motivated, and I think that's uh, they were just. It, it was incredibly, incredibly genius that they were the main people at this in this program. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Next week, we're focusing on the American Revolution. 
the editor of the Journal of the American Revolution, will be here. And we've got a two-part special, The Christmas Crossing, debuting on Christmas Eve. The narrative special features historian Alan Gelzo. It's often said that no military plan ever survives the first contact with the enemy. Well, Washington's plan started to come unraveled even before contact. That's Christmas week on Point of the Spear. Thanks for listening to the program. I hope you'll support our guests by clicking on the book purchase link in this episode's description. Each purchase helps support local bookstores, and that's always a good thing. Now, the program at uh, Camp Hunt, I read where they didn't employ corporal punishment. They did not employ corporal punishment, and it's really interesting at this this, um, reunion that I talked about that took place late uh, in in September of 2007. Uh, Many of the veterans who who had been at Fort Hunt came back for this reunion. They received an award from the Army. The Army and the Park Service and the Army sponsored this uh, this reunion. And the Army gave them awards. And a number of the people who spoke, and I actually have, um, I'm actually quoting them in the book. I have a section on this on this um, reunion. Made it, They wanted to make it absolutely clear that they did not torture anybody. Now, The context of this was very important because it was very clear by that time that the uh, military and the CIA had been torturing prisoners in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, it was it was was almost, I would say, common knowledge by that point. They wanted to make it very clear that they did not do that. Furthermore, they did not condone what the army was doing to try to get information. Uh, And so um, they I, I mentioned it probably way more than I should in the book. But it's such an important part of the story that I feel like, you know, you talk about it, you repeat it, you repeat it. Maybe by the end, people get that. No, they did not torture prisoners. (laughs) But that said, um, they had a lot of ways of getting information from prisoners. So um, if someone refused to, first of all, the, the the first, I think, most important thing was they treated them very, very well. So they gave them really good food. Uh, if they wanted to play, um, you know, ping pong or pool or um, learn how to play horseshoes, it was something that the Germans did not know about and, mm-hmm. and learn to play, which to me is kind of fascinating because, you know, a horseshoe is a great big, huge piece of metal. And if yeah. they wanted to, they could clock one of the. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, they, so they mostly what they did was they treated them very, very well. If someone was was very you know, gave them a lot of information. They would take them to a really, really nice dinner at one of the finest restaurants in D.C. Um, and uh, they they just really treated them well. Some of the some of the ones who were uh, you know pretty high up in the German um, hierarchy even had private huts that they lived in um, at Fort Hunt. Wow. Um, there's one story that I I I put in the book mostly for fun, that one of the generals who was at Fort Hunt wanted wanted a woman, and he made it very clear exactly what he meant by that. So mm-hmm. the soldier assigned to him took him to a brothel in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and while this American soldier was waiting for the general to do whatever he's doing, um, you can use your imagination, mm-hmm. um, the place was raided by D.C. police. Oh, no. And he was, you know, terrified because what's he going to do? I've got this German general here. And, and, well, it turns out that there were senators and congressmen and diplomats in the same place. And when the police realized who what they were up against, they decided to just leave it alone and leave. <laughs> thank you very much. We're going to. Yes, thank you very it. much. So, um, <laughs> so that was the main thing that they did was they really treated the prisoners well. But there were some who didn't want to talk. And so they had several ways of dealing with them. One of them was, one of the ways was they would take them down. Um, Fort Hunt um, was built around 1900 as a coast artillery fort. And they had these huge concrete gun emplacements. And below these emplacements were the powder magazines. They're still there. They're so huge um, that they'll be there for generations. But what they would do, they would take them down and lock them in these uh, underground um, powder magazines. You know, be dark and damp. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'd lock them in there. 
they said that they never put anybody there overnight. So they put them in there for like a day or so. They say, okay, you're ready to talk now. And, and hopefully they would do that. Um, that was one technique. The one technique that worked almost flawlessly with people who refused to talk was there were two men at Fort Hunt who were Russian Americans, okay. Alexander Dallin and Alex Shedlinsky. And they were dressed up in red army uniforms. And of course they spoke Russian. Right. And they would sit in on some of the interviews that looked like they were gonna be, that they weren't gonna say a whole lot. And they would say, okay, uh, you don't wanna talk? Fine, Out. Ivan here would be very happy to take you to the Soviet Union. Maybe they would like to hear what you have to say. Yes. Um, and that that actually uh, worked even in Europe. Uh, one of the fellows who was, again, not at Port Hunt, but um, he was, I talked, I actually interviewed him because he's one of the few that's still um, still very much alive. And, and uh, Guy Stern, in Europe, he and his buddy had a, a good cop, bad, bad cop, um, routine and his friend um fred howard would start interviewing germans and if they didn't want to talk they'd say well you know you had your chance now i'm going to take you over to commissar commissar kukov who was guy stern who was dressed in a in a red army uniform he had a picture it was in a tent he had a picture of stalin on the wall mm -hmm. and he had a would use a really thick 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 russian accented german um, and it's same thing, you know, if you don't want to talk, sorry, we're going to have to send you to the Soviet Union. Um, that was so effective that it worked about 80% of the time. Oh, they did not want to go. They did not want to go to the Russians. They Quite, did not want to go to the Russians. Cool. So it worked very, very frequently. <laughs> Quite a reputation. Now there's one, there's one story at Fort Hunt and I, I, uh, apparently it was common knowledge. I didn't actually, uh, see or read anyone who actually observed this but um it was it was common knowledge around the fort that there was a fellow who was sort of a shady double agent uh, by the name of rolf um what's his name rolf, rolf i got it here somewhere um rolf art uh and he would sort of be in and out of fort hunt he really hated waffen ss soldiers mm -hmm. So we heard about this one soldier who refused to talk and they took him down to one of these gun batteries and through a hole in the, in the, in the, the door, um, turned on, turned a, a, a um, vacuum cleaner in reverse to pour dust into the cell. And they said, you know, we're going to gash you. And if you don't talk, you know, this is, you're going to, so they opened it up and said, are you willing? So they did it two or three times. And finally, the guy talked um, because, you know, the, that's what the Germans would do. They would gas people, to get them to talk. And so, sure. um, and, but the story, I was kind of wondering whether I should use this or not, because I didn't actually have, but there was, it was confirmed by several others. And one said that there was a variation on the story that, that yes, they did all this, but instead of using a uh, vacuum cleaner, they used insecticide and uh, the, this art fellow was, was um, uh, reprimanded for doing this uh, so that we just don't do that. That's that's very close to torture and we're just not gonna do that here. Yeah, I, I would consider that probably close to- Now, if they, if they didn't talk, and some of them didn't, um, they would just send them to, uh, you know, there were, there, were some, there were some POW camps that were not very desirable. They were, you know, sort of the, where they'd send the real nasties to and they would, that's what they would do. Was there, what was the biggest piece of actionable intelligence that came out of the program? You know, it's hard to say. Um, there, there were there were some things that came out. I think I would say, you know, it's funny you asked the question, and I and I thought about it for a bit. I would say, I would say, really, the importance was everything was cumulative. I see. Yep. So, for example, um, the MIRS, the Military Intelligence Research um, Group, section. yeah, section. They um, they put together what's called a Red Book which was the order of battle of the German army. And they did several, there were several different um, editions of this. And 
it had every single every single group within the within the German army. They would identify where they were, who was the commander, who was the chief of staff, where they were, where they'd been. They analyzed everything. There was like a whole section on the, um, the SS in all the different editions. Um, spent a great deal of time analyzing uh, the German activities in France, in France and Belgium right before D-Day. I mean, they're not going to say, oh, if you get a hold of this, guess what? We're going to attack you on D-Day. No, but they, they provided a tremendous amount of information. So, um, and then they had, they did, um, they, they uh, provided a lot of other information. They had, they had several individual um, publications that were very important as well. So that was very important. Now, did that have a specific um, advantage for a specific event? Probably not, but it certainly helped with D-Day, and it certainly helped with the with the conduct of the war. So that was important. Um, there was there were some there was two fellows overheard two prisoners talking about the German um, rocket program before it actually started, and they passed the news along, and uh, that was that. But unfortunately, it probably did not get to the right people because uh, they even knew where it was, Panamunde, which was at the uh, uh, northeastern Germany on the Baltic. Um, but it probably did not get to the right people at the right time, but that would have been very valuable. Yeah. Um, I think in some ways, from, from the story that we have here, which, of course, you have to realize that um, a lot of the things that we that we have and a lot of the story that I have is from the later part of um, Fort Hunt because many of the people who were there early on were, were just gone when we started the start of the oral history. Yeah, but a lot of what came out of this was helped the Americans when they were gearing up for the Cold War. So, for example, one thing that was really really critical was to find all of the plans and specifications and everything for the rocket program. And so what they found, what they learned at Fort Hunt, that it was in a, all of these records were in a salt cavern, um, a salt mine cavern. And the only one who knew about it was this old salt miner in Germany. They said who it was. The Americans found him. <clears throat> they were able to take him to this, or the, he led them to this salt um, cavern. They got all the records, everything of, wow. for the rocket program. Um, as a result of that. So uh, that was very important. But then there were other things. So for example, um, the, uh, uh, the allies would, would attack um, German train stations or train depots, you know, places that seemed like they right. were, were where there would be um, where the trains would load and unload. But the next day, uh, the trains were running as if nothing had happened. But what they found at Fort Hunt was that what they were doing was they were loading and unloading at cross at crossings, rail crossings. So they could do that all over Germany. And so they started looking for, you know, they'd start looking for sign like, you know, there are a bunch of transports at the rail crossing. Right. They would they, they would they would start bombing and then they started having success. So that was one thing. Another one was that they they had the same thing with um submarines at there were submarines in um, Hamburg and they bombed the, the Germans would keep the submarines in a in in a um, under under a cover in in pens mm -hmm. and so they bombed the pens but the next day the submarines were running like like they had been well it turns out they had made a false cover the Americans were the allies bombed this false cover didn't do any damage well then when they found out that it was a little further in then they started bombing the actual pens and they had more success so there were i would say you put all these things together and it was tremendously successful yeah. um was it was did it end the war <clears throat> you know there's it's i've read everything i could find on intelligence operations this included of the allies and there are some who think that it probably shortened the war by two years. 
Wow. That's, that's significant. Yeah, that's that. And not, you know, Fort Hunt just was one part of it. It was not certainly the most, uh, it, you know, of course, people over there thought it was the most important part, but yeah. it was one part. Um, someone else said that by the end of the war, because of this elaborate and really pretty amazing intelligence program, they said Eisenhower probably knew more about the German military operations than Hitler did because of how, and that, and, and I, I really, I don't think that's, I don't think that's really an exaggeration. I think that probably um, has some credibility. And a lot of, you know, Hitler by the end of the war was so paranoid that I don't know what he, right. you know, what he took or didn't take. But um, anyway, it was, it was a really successful program. The book is called Nazis on the Potomac, the top secret intelligence operation that helped win World War II. Bob, thank you so much for being on the show. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. And you're welcome. That's it for this episode. Thanks again for joining me. Next week, we're focusing on the American Revolution. The editor of the Journal of the American Revolution will be here, and we've got a two-part special, The Christmas Crossing, debuting on Christmas Eve. The narrative special features historian Alan Galzo. It's often said that no military plan ever survives the first contact with the enemy. Well, Washington's plan started to come unraveled even before contact. That's Christmas week on Point of the Spear. And if you like what you hear, leave a review or a rating or just click the follow button. You can find me on Twitter, at Rob Child, where you can share your comments about the show. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group. I wanted to take a moment to thank our growing army of listener supporter members. You make it possible to continue our mission of bringing you the best military history authors, filmmakers, and movers and shakers. If you're not a member yet, it's easy to join, and it takes just seconds. Scroll down to the bottom of this episode's description and click the support link. You'll come to our anchor page, click the support button, complete the brief form. It's that easy. We're planning loyalty perks and giveaways to roll out over the coming months for our early supporters who sign on before the end of the year. So don't wait. Become a member today, and thank you for your support.